Hello, welcome to my talk on why Reynolds number is so important in fluid dynamics. This talk is on the applications of Reynolds number for improving the performances of airfoils. When the airplanes increase their speed and when the wind turbines increase their size, the corresponding Reynolds numbers become increased. It is found that from the wind tunnel test as well as two days CFD modeling, airfoil performances have been well linked with the relevant Reynolds number. In this talk, we will see how the earlier airfoils have been involved to the modern airfoils and what is the main reason to make such an evolution. In the early 1880s in Britain, Horatio Phillips built an um, improved wind tunnel for testing airfoils. And due to the nature of low Reynolds numbers in the wind tunnel test, Phillips could develop and patent a series of Cambod thin airfoils. See the picture here. These airfoils have the following features. All the airfoils are Cambod thin airfoils. All leading edges are sharp. We can imagine such airfoils should have good aerodynamic performances from our initial intuitions with the thin airfoil and the sharp leading edge. In fact, these types of airfoils were well accepted by the practitioners such as Otto Lianta, Red Brothers, and the World War I aircraft. See the next few slides. Here, I must emphasize the maximum lift and uh, drag ratio of these airfoils is about a 10. Otto Lilianta was a German pioneer of aviation. As both researchers and uh, practitioners in aviation, Lilianta's contribution would be his successful glide flight. Based on the reference one, he made more than 2,000 grade flights, and uh, he lost his life in an accident in a glider flight. Lilianta's success in glider flight had significantly inspired both Kuta through his supervisor and uh, Zhukovsky for developing their mathematical method for protecting the lift of the airfoil. Now, the famous Kuta Zhukovsky theory, which was the last piece for the classical aerodynamics. Wright Brothers, the inventors of the first successful airplane. The significant events were on December 17, 1903, the right flyer lifted into the air and flew for about 12 seconds, covering 120 feet over the ground. This flight was in a headwind but it is actually heavier than air flight in the aviation history. From the calculation, the air speed is about 14.9 meters per second, and the ground speed is about 3 meters per second. And the more successful story was the one less in a year on September 20th, 1904, they made a four closed socket flight. The average speed is 13.8 meters per second. 
covering 1,244 meters in one minute and a half. And after that, more successful stories in aviation have been seen. Before 1920, all the planes were in low speed, including those aircraft in World War I. The maximum speed is about 150 kilometers per hour. The design of the airplanes would be similar. Most were by airplanes, and occasionally we saw triplanes. All these planes adopted the thin airfoils, but the strings and the studs must be used for supporting the wings. This would increase the aerodynamic drag for the planes. In 1920s, the well-designed airplane would have a maximum lift-to-drag ratio of 9. Compared to the modern airplane, today's commercial flight, the speed would be about 900 km per hour. And the fastest manned aircraft, X-15, the speed is larger than 7,200 km per hour. And for most of the commercial planes, the maximum lift to drag ratio would be between 16 to 20. Here, the list of the airfoils evolution from earlier 20th centuries to 1940s. Due to the increase of the airplane speed, the maximum speed in World War II would be about 400 miles per hour or 640 kilometers per hour, more than four times of the airplane speed in World War I. Thus, the corresponding Reynolds number would be increased accordingly. Based on the increased Reynolds number, the airfoils were evolved as seen in the list. The change we can see from the evolution of the airfoils. The airfoils become thicker and the leading edge becomes rounder. This is for maintaining a smooth airflow at varying angles of attack to the airflow. Therefore, most subsonic airfoils have a rounded leading edge. The scientific evidence was very obvious when we compared the lift against the drag for the thin flat plate, the thin cambered plate, and an airfoil. When the Reynolds number is low at 40,000, if we calculate the airspeed for a court at 0.1 meter, the airspeed would be 6 meters per second. And in this low Reynolds number, we can see the airfoil performs very bad compared to the flood thing and the cambered thing airfoil. And we can see the maximum lift to drag ratio is about 30 for the cambered thing plate. However, when the Reynolds number is increased to 120,000, the corresponding airspeed would be 18 meters per second with the same chord. We can see here the flood thin plate and the cambered thin plate would perform very similar as in the low Reynolds number. But the significant change has been on the airfoil. The lift coefficient has been largely increased from about 0.5 to more than 1.3, as well as the drag coefficient decreases. So the maximum lift to drag ratio would be higher than that of the cambered thin plate. 
it is at about 45. If we compare the earlier airfoil to the modern plastic airfoil, the maximum left to drag ratio would be about 100 based on the reference. One extreme case is the research work in the reference 4, where an airfoil is proposed with the maximum lift to drag ratio about 600. Obviously, this airfoil has no practical use since it was purely designed to show what we can obtain in theory. Currently, the wind turbines become larger and larger and the largest wind turbines aiming to produce 20 megawatt power. That means the wind turbine become larger. Accordingly, the corresponding local Reynolds number based on the local court would be larger than 10 million. Here, take the airfoil NACA 633-018 as an example. Generally, for most of the airfoil, the database may have the data with the highest Reynolds number less than 10 million. So in this case, we need to examine the airfoil performance in a large Reynolds number, say 20 million. Here, we can see the lift coefficient would be different for the Reynolds number of 9 million and the Reynolds number of 20 million. So we can see the higher Reynolds number, the airfoil would have a larger lift coefficient. If we look at the jug curve against the lift, we can see the difference for different Reynolds number is quite large. See here, the larger the Reynolds number, the smaller of the drug coefficient. Now if we take CL equaling to 1.2 as the design point, for the Reynolds number at 9 million, the corresponding lift to drug ratio would be about 105. However, for the Reynolds number at 20 million, the lift to drug ratio would increase to 130. This means when the Reynolds number increased from 9 million to 20 million, the lift to drug ratio increased by 23.8%. In the previous slides, we have seen the different performances of airfoil at different Reynolds numbers. But how we can examine the difference? Currently, we can use CFD for such a modeling, but the most reliable method would be steer the wind tunnel test. One question here is how we can achieve the correct Reynolds number when a smaller model is tested in the wind tunnel. This is true for most wind tunnels. Luckily, there are some special wind tunnels to allow us to achieve the correct Reynolds number for a smaller model. In the next three slides, we will examine how we can achieve this practically. The principle behind this application is the ideal gas equation given by this. Here, R is the specific gas constant. And uh, we can see if we take the temperature as a constant, then we can see the density would be proportional to the pressure. See this plot. And uh, based on the Reynolds number definition, in this case, if we keep the velocity and the length same, and when we increase the pressure, the viscosity 
would not change. Here, the viscosity is only dependent on temperature. That means, in this case, the Reynolds number would be proportional to the air density. So this is the principle for the first variable density turner in the world. It was invented by Max Mank in 1921, and the turner opened in 1923. If we look at the details of the inside of the variable density turner, the working section had a diameter of 1.5 meter, and the working pressure is up to 20 atmospheric pressure, and the maximum air speed is about 22 meters per second. This wind turner produced the data for eight classic airfoil ships totaling 78 airfoils. The details can be found in the report, the reference here. The modern pressurized wind tunnel would be very similar to the first variable density tunnel, but in a much larger scale. On and on, Low speed pressurized wind tunnel in France. It's such a wind tunnel, see the picture here. From the drawing, this pressurized wind tunnel is very different from the first variable density tunnel, but very similar to the conventional wind tunnel. The main difference is that this wind tunnel has a large pressurized tank here to provide the necessary pressure for the wind tunnel. This wind tunnel has a much larger working section, 3.5 meter times 4.5 meter, and the much larger maximum wind speed at slightly more than 120 meters per second. However, the working pressure would be only up to 3.85 bars. And in the wind tunnel test, the largest Reynolds number is about 20 million. In this wind tunnel, the Reynolds number will be increased proportionally with the air density, depending on the pressure applied in the wind tunnel. This plot gives the possible Reynolds number we can achieve per unit length. For instance, if we keep the Mach number unchanged at 0.2, the Reynolds number can be increased from 1.7 million to 6.8 million, 3.85 times as large in the Reynolds number. In this slide, the European transonic wind tunnel, a cryogenic wind tunnel, is introduced on how a much larger Reynolds number can be achieved in this specific wind tunnel. See the plot here, which again is similar to the conventional wind tunnel from the plot, but there are some differences. The wind tunnel can be both pressure raised up to 4.5 bars and the temperature can be changed to very low, such as minus 172 degrees Celsius. The gas in the wind tunnel is nitrogen and we can see the liquid nitrogen can be injected into the tunnel, while the gas nitrogen can be brought off if the pressure is too high in the tunnel. For such a wind tunnel, a very large Reynolds number can be achieved using both a high pressure for a high gas density and a low temperature for a low gas viscosity. This plot is redrawn based on the data in the reference. Suppose we have an airfoil of a cord length 0.22 meter. So for the conventional condition, at one atmospheric pressure 
at 12.5 degrees Celsius. The Reynolds number would be about 8 million. If we apply the pressure in the wind tunnel up to 3.5 bars, the Reynolds number would be increased to 28 million here. If we keep the pressure at the atmospheric pressure and lower the temperature to minus 172 degrees Celsius, the Reynolds number can be increased to 50 million, the point 2 here. If we use both high pressure and low temperature in the cryogenic wind tunnel, this is actually the cryogenic wind tunnel 4, the Reynolds number can be increased to 136 million. It would be 56 times larger as that in the conventional atmosphere. This Reynolds number is in the range of the Reynolds number for the four airplane. It should be noted here this type of wind tunnel test would come at a cost. It would be very expensive for a test in such a wind tunnel in both preparation and operation. For example, a conventional test in such a wind tunnel, the preparation and the test would generally last months. Hence, the cost would be very high.